Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Back in April of 2023, I released a video on the strange world of the Q-Factor. Now, if you missed that video, there's a link up in the corner and in the description for you. Q-Factor relates to both inductors and capacitors, yet when you look at the data sheet for a capacitor, you will rarely find a specification for its Q. Most times, you will find data on a capacitor's dissipation factor and sometimes on its power factor, but almost never its Q. So what are these things and how do they relate to Q? These are the questions I hope to answer here in this video. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, to begin with, we have to have a bit of background behind the ideal and real life capacitors so that the dissipation factor, Q, and power factor make sense. So let's begin with the ideal capacitor. It consists of two separate conductors with some sort of insulating material in between. This insulating material is called the dielectric. A good dielectric easily develops opposing electric fields within itself in the presence of an electric field. The amount of capacitance varies with the surface area of the conductors, the distance between the conductors, and the dielectric constant of the insulating material between them. For a detailed look at this, I would point you to my video on understanding capacitance. There's a link up in the corner and down in the description for you. When a sinusoidal AC voltage of a given frequency F and a given voltage V applied is applied to an ideal capacitor, the current to the capacitor is easily calculated with this simple formula. The current to the capacitor is equal to J times the applied voltage times two times pi times the frequency in Hertz times the capacitance in farads. Notice that there's no real portion of this current. It exists entirely on the positive reactive axis of our Cartesian coordinate system, where the real or resistive values are plotted on the horizontal axis. One characteristic of a perfect capacitor is that once you've infused it with charge, this charge, as seen through the voltage across it, never goes away. It will forever exist. In other words, the charge never dissipates. However, there's no such thing as an ideal capacitor. Well, real-life capacitors are made up of real-life lossy materials. Let's start with the conductors. All conductors have resistance. All connections between conductors has resistance. All conductors have inductance. Then there's the dielectric. All dielectrics have leakage. Oh, what do I mean by leakage? A dielectric is not a perfect insulator. Current leaks through the material. Now, not a lot of current, but current nonetheless. As a result, you charge a capacitor and come back some time later to discover that it is completely discharged. The charge is dissipated through the leakage current of the capacitor. How does all this affect our model of a real-life capacitor? So let me build a simple model of a real-life capacitor with you. The complete model is, well, much more complicated. Starting at the core, we have the ideal capacitor. The reality of the leakage of the dielectric material is represented by a large value resistor in parallel with the ideal capacitor in this capacitor model. The reality of the resistance of all of the conductors and the internal connections is represented by a series resistor in the basic capacitor model. This is what we call the equivalent series resistance or ESR of the capacitor. Finally, all of the conductors also have some inductance associated with them because, well, 
all conductors have inductance, no matter how small that might be. This reality is represented by a series inductor in our capacitor model. This is the equivalent series inductance of the capacitor. Unfortunately, this particular aspect of a real capacitor is rarely provided on any data sheet. The presence of this inductance is what causes the self-resonance of a capacitor. As we approach the frequency where the inductive reactance of this inductance equals the capacitive reactance of the capacitor, the actual measured capacitance starts to decrease. Once we pass this frequency, our capacitor now looks like an inductor. In fact, here's a case in point. Here's a screenshot of a Smith chart showing how a 0.1 microfarad capacitor turns into an inductor at about 29 megahertz. Marker 2 is at the equator between the inductive reactants and capacitive reactants. If we look at the phase of the impedance of this capacitor, you can see that it shifts abruptly from minus 180 degrees, meaning capacitive, to plus 180 degrees, meaning inductive, at about 29 megahertz. At 10 megahertz, the actual measured capacitance of this 0.1 microfarad capacitor is now 0.018 microfarad. Not very impressive, is it? Now, how does this play out in practice? So consider the model as we think about the current. We have an ideal capacitor in parallel with a resistor, which represents the leakage. All of this is in series with another resistor, which represents the equivalent series resistance, or ESR. And then finally, we have a series inductor, well, because all conductors have inductance. To make matters worse, the series resistance and inductance, the leakage resistance, and the real capacitance do not remain constant across both frequency and temperature. All of these things are affected by the vagarities of dielectric losses, electrode resistances, and other parasitic effects within the capacitor. The point here is that the actual current through the capacitor at any given frequency is comprised of both reactive and real components. This means that the vector that represents this current resides somewhere in the first quadrant of our Cartesian coordinate system. It has a definitive angle with respect to the reactive or imaginary axis. So, what is this dissipation factor? Well, remember that the perfect ideal capacitor's current would reside only on the vertical or reactive axis and the real-world capacitor's current resides in the first quadrant with a definitive angle between it and the vertical axis. We will label this angle with the Greek letter delta. The tangent of this angle is referred to as the dissipation factor for the capacitor. Thus, the dissipation factor is equal to the real portion of this current divided by the reactive portion of this current. For a given applied voltage at a given frequency, this can also be expressed as the resistive portion of the capacitor's impedance divided by the magnitude of the reactive portion of the capacitor's impedance. So, if the actual impedance of the capacitor is equal to R sub C minus Jx sub C, then the dissipation factor would be equal to R sub C divided by the magnitude of X sub C. For instance, the impedance of a 37 picofarad capacitor at 25.375 megahertz and 21.7 degrees Celsius is 4.334 minus J 227.74. The dissipation factor for this capacitor at this frequency, applied voltage and temperature would be 4.334 divided by 227.74 or 0 0.019.
In some places, this would be expressed in terms of 1.9%. So, how does this relate to Q? Well, without going into the details about Q, we learned in my video on Q that the Q of either a capacitor or an inductor is equal to the magnitude of the reactive portion of the impedance divided by the resistive portion. So, for a capacitor, this would be that Q is equal to the magnitude of, of the capacitive reactants divided by the resistance, R sub C. Now, this should look pretty much familiar. It is the inverse of the dissipation factor. So, the Q of a capacitor is equal to 1 divided by the dissipation factor. It's just that simple. So, for our example 37 picofarad capacitor at 25.375 MHz and 21.7 degrees C, the Q of this capacitor would be equal to 1 divided by 0 0.019 or 52.55. Okay, we have all of this down, but what about this power factor business? Well, let's go back to our model for a moment. If we're passing current through this capacitor at a given frequency, then there will be a current flowing through the equivalent series resistance. Current through a resistor produces heat. In other words, power dissipated or lost in the form of heat. The power factor is a measure of how much power is lost to the ESR and dissipated in heat. Put simply, the power factor can be found by dividing the ESR by the magnitude of the impedance of the capacitor at a given frequency, applied voltage, and temperature. Going back to our Cartesian coordinate system, we see the vector which represents the total current through the capacitor. This can also represent the magnitude of the impedance of the capacitor at this frequency. We consider the angle between the horizontal axis and the vector. I will call this theta. The cosine of this angle is equal to the ESR divided by the magnitude of the total impedance of the capacitor or the length of this vector. Thus, the power factor is equal to the cosine of the angle theta. Sometimes, this is expressed as a percentage. A 10% power factor is the same as a power factor of 0.1. Now, because we talked about dissipation factor as being the tangent of the angle between the vertical axis and the vector, we can also relate this same angle to power factor. Power factor is also equal to the sine of this same angle delta between the vertical axis and the vector. You can translate power factor to dissipation factor with this formula. Dissipation factor is equal to the tangent of the inverse sine of the power factor. Now, let's just spend a couple of minutes looking at some data sheets so you can figure out how they represent all of this stuff. Well, I'm looking at the data sheet for a 20 picofarad surface mount ceramic capacitor. Here on this page of the data sheet, notice that we find a specification for the Q or dissipation factor. They claim a Q of greater than 400. Notice that they specify the frequency, temperature, and voltage at which this is measured. Now, let's look at a data sheet for an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. Take a look here at this specification table and notice that there are three columns labeled ripple current, ESR, and tan delta. Now we recognize the first two, but what about this tan delta business? This is the dissipation factor, which is the tangent of the angle delta. Now remember that these will change with applied voltage, frequency, and temperature. So we have to pay attention to the little numbers next to each of these. These numbers point us down to the bottom of the table where we find that the ripple current was measured at a frequency of 100 kilohertz 
and 105 degrees Celsius. The ESR was measured at 100 kilohertz and 20 degrees Celsius, and tan delta, or the dissipation factor, was measured at 120 hertz and 20 degrees Celsius. So, you rightfully ask, at what applied voltage? Well, unfortunately, well, they don't tell us this. So, what do we do then? Well, we're stuck with assuming that these were measured with the rated voltage applied. So, now let's just take a look at one more data sheet with the power factor in mind this time. Well, here I have an excerpt from the data sheet of a motor start capacitor. Look at the last specification. It is a general specification for all of the capacitors represented in this data sheet of 10% maximum power factor, except on capacitors of less than or equal to 30 microfarad. These would have a maximum power factor of 12%. So what do they mean by percent when power factor is the cosine of an angle? Well, 10% is just another way of saying 0.1 and 12% 0.12. So you ask, under what conditions? Now, based on how this is presented, I would assume that this is likely their promised power factor within the entire operating range of the capacitor, which is based on extensive internal testing. This gives us the worst case results from their testing plus a safety factor. Well, hopefully this all helps dissipate the mystery behind these terms and what they mean. So dissipation factor, power factor, and Q all describe the same basic issue. We have imperfect capacitors which don't act like ideal capacitors. While dissipation factor and Q actually are looking at the same aspects of this imperfection, they do so from a slightly different point of view. The power factor is taken from the perspective of power lost in our imperfect capacitor due to its equivalent series resistance at a particular operating frequency. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, to loot.